This is the Note Closer Show, where you get the latest developments in distressed note investing and learn the secrets of how you can control millions of dollars worth of property for pennies on the dollar. Get educated and entertained by someone who has closed thousands of deals and lives to support you in achieving the same. Now, here's your host, CEO of We Close Notes, Scott Carson. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this episode of the Note Closer Show. As always, Scott Carson, excited to be here with you today. I'm even more jacked up to have a buddy of mine join me all the way from Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, this guy is a rock star, a longtime real estate investor, uh, spent some time in the note space, um, but just absolutely delivering some goods out to people out there. He's also a fellow podcaster, but this guy is just doing some amazing things, really taking people to the whole next level when it comes to income. So I'm ex- excited to have from the next, uh, our, our good buddy, Christopher Larson, kicking butt and taking names, joining us from Asheville this, this morning. Good morning, Chris. How's it going, bud? Scott, good morning. I'm psyched to be here. Yeah, man. Glad to have you. And, and you, uh, you've done some amazing things. So for our listeners who weren't familiar with you, take a couple minutes or take a couple seconds, however long, and tell us a little bit kind of your background and, and kind of what you're focused on. Yes, Scott, thanks for the opportunity. I've been an investor for over 20 years. Uh, I bought my first property at age 21. I was investing in the stock market before that. Uh, I bought pools of distressed debt like we were talking about before the show. I've always wanted to be an investor, Um, but really it came down to freedom. I was in college. I went to Virginia Tech. I was studying engineering, but really what I loved was racing bicycles, and I wanted to be a professional cyclist. I trained with Lance Armstrong. I trained at the uh, Olympic training center. Um, my, my best friend was, was my roommate. He was my training partner. And between my freshman and sophomore years, he died of a massive brain hemorrhage. Wow. And I put my head down and I basically just poured my heart and soul into racing for the next year. And I, I had a breakthrough. I, I was a category one, which is basically the level you need to be to take out a professional license. I was winning a ton of regional races. I was traveling nationally and uh, Labor Day weekend came around, and it was my friend's memorial race, second memorial race, and I, I won. I won in like dominant fashion, and by all accounts, I should have been thrilled. I came across the line, and not only was I not happy, I felt no emotion. Oh, man. A week later, I decided to quit racing. I just, I, I couldn't figure out why this sport and this life that I, I loved and was so passionate about didn't make me happy. And I got back to school and I was probably a little depressed and I took a step back and, and tried to figure out what I wanted to do. And a good family friend, I talk about this in my, in my book, um, which if your audience wants, they can go to our website, nextlevelincome.com and then click on the book link and get a copy. It kind of goes a little bit deeper into it. But I had a family friend that introduced me to cycling. He also introduced me to investing, a Roth IRA, compounded interest. And I was day trading in the stock market. I was making like $5,000 a month in college. Uh, but I was also losing money time from time to time. Yeah. And there was one morning, it was about 3 a.m. I hadn't slept and I was thinking about a trade. And I thought, man, like, is this really how I want to live my life? What I was chasing was freedom. And what I realized was that wasn't being an investor. That wasn't freedom. And I started looking at other options. I read as many books as I can get my hands on. I read over 250 books on investing, real estate, all different things. And I decided that real estate was a good fit for what I wanted to do. At age 21, I bought my first investment property, kind of did like a house hack. I rented out the rooms, bought the place next door, bought another, bought another, bought another, had a portfolio of properties. Now, I didn't have a lot of money. I, my family didn't have a ton of money. So I then went out and found a career that would, I could make a lot of money. I spent 15 years in the medical device space and I put as much money as I could into these real estate investments. And ultimately over the past six, seven years transitioned exclusively into commercial real estate, specifically multifamily. We've been syndicating those deals for about five years now. And now my goal is to help others through education and opportunities achieve financial independence as well. That's awesome, Chris. Uh, I think we, all of us go through a transition in lives trying to figure out who we want to be when we grow up. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of people out there right now are are doing, feeling the same thing. Am I doing something that's going to make sense long-term? Uh, am I accomplishing all the goals that I want to to do? And a lot of us are like what you were talking about. You're going through things you get to be at the pinnacle. You're like, is this really what I want to do at the point when you get reached that peak, when you're, when you're winning the race, 
you know, uh, figuratively speaking there for you. Um, you know, yeah. you talk about buying debt and then also being in the, in the multifamily commercial space. Let's, let's dive into that for our listeners out there. Cause there's so much of a, our listeners are looking at that space. Uh, and, and I'm glad, you know, we'll talk about some of your debt uh, purchases here in a little bit here, but where do you think the market is going? Let's start first with that, the multifamily market. And I know we don't have a, we don't have a glass ball to look at. We can't see the future. We can look a little bit back at our, our the, you know, history. But where do you think the multifamily space is going to go with everything happening in the market these days, Chris? That's a good question. So at the core, I'm a demographics guy, Scott. Uh, and again, probably everything I talk about, I go through kind of in detail in my books. So I'm, I'm an engineer. I'm a data guy. I was in school and I started, I, you know, I was reading stuff. And one of the uh, books I read was by Harry S. Dent. And some people think he's crazy. He comes up with these predictions. But if, if you read about Harry S. Dent, he's a demographics guy. He talks about these big demographic trends. And I look at it like tidal shifts. So if you, if you know the tide's coming in, you know the tide's going out, you might not know where the waves are going to hit if you're a surfer, but you, you know when to go out and go surfing. And that's how I look at it. So I was looking at demographics and that's what led me into the medical device space. I knew the baby boomers were going to need surgery. And then I started looking, okay, where are these people going to move? I was in DC after I graduated from Virginia Tech. I ended up getting my MBA in finance portfolio management. My wife and I, now wife and I moved up to the DC area to start our careers. And I said, man, people are moving to the Southeast. So my wife and I moved to North Carolina, I moved to Asheville, not only for the quality of life, but for the demographics. So when I was doing an analysis of my portfolio, uh, back in my like early mid thirties, I, I, I came across the multifamily space and I saw the same things with the millennials that I was seeing with the baby boomers. So really what I look at is where are we go in this next decade? I'll tell you, I can't predict what the rest of this year is going to look like, Scott. I could tell you what our, you know, collection rates are per property and go through that. But what the next three, six, nine months holds, I don't know. Here's what I know. I know the trends and the fundamentals of the multifamily space aren't changing over the next 10 years. We still need three, 350,000 new units per year just to keep up with demand. We need about 4 million new units this decade to meet demand. So that's not changing. I think actually what's happening now is going to put a strain on supply. And we're seeing that. We're seeing units being pulled off or new projects being pulled off the market. We're seeing homeowners are, are delinquent on their rents in record numbers going back. And that means that more people are going to rent. I don't, I'm not happy about that, but that's a fundamental change or that's a fundamental that's not going to change going forward. So I think short term, there's certainly going to be some unique opportunities for people that got a little overextended. So if you're looking to acquire a property and you have cash to deploy, I think that's going to be a good time because if you believe in the long-term fundamentals, that's not changing. Totally agree with everything you're saying there. Uh, it definitely be needed, especially when you're looking at what 10, 10% of all homeowners are in forbearance agreement right now. And before this all happened, you know, I've been saying, you know, one in 10 Americans are already a month behind on their mortgage before this happened. Yeah. You know, it's a scary thing. And so, yeah, we're going to need the affordable housing. I don't think it's just going to be the multifamily thing. That's going to be the mobile home park aspect of things. People are going to have to downsize or figure out where to go. And you're right. It's not just in where you're at and where I'm at nationwide, there's a huge need. For, for housing, it's affordability, multifamily, and things like that. The one thing I am a little concerned about in that space is, as we've seen, is that I think multifamily obviously has been a peak. It's been the most uh, aggressive asset class, I think, for the most part. I, I hesitate to say, but almost the most overpriced aspect of things, because you get a lot of people moving That's into certainly. it, I think, overpaying for assets with the idea that they're going to cash out of it in two to three years. And you and I, but you're shaking your head agreeing exactly with me on that. You've got to be in that yeah. long term, knowing when the tide's coming and going out. I love that analogy. So there's going to be some opportunities, people that a over leverage the property, overpaid for it, that you can pick up on the debt side in in 12 to 24 months, for the most part. You would you? I take it you'd agree to that, huh? I do, and you know, with with uh, my partners, we've looked at at similar trends. And actually, about nine, twelve months ago, we started looking at A class properties because we said, okay, hey, there's a pullback. And again, you can you can watch these trends. I mean, I talk about in my book going back to the savings and loan crisis in the early '90s, watching both my parents lose their jobs. I lost my internship coming out of 2000. You know, I was there in the Great Recession. Um, you can you can see these trends in real estate. So. 
you know, my partners and I, we looked at that and said, Hey, what if, what if we looked at some higher quality properties? And what I mean by that is properties with residents that have more stable occupations, they have higher income, they're not going to suffer as much in a downturn. So I think, you know, you, you have to be selective within the space. So you say multifamily, well, what are you talking about? Are you talking about class C properties? Are you talking about affordable housing? Are you talking about subsidized properties? Are you talking about luxury properties? You know, I've always been a fan of B, A minus in that space. Um, although we have properties going back into the seventies that have been built. So I, I think you definitely have to be selective. We've seen cap rate compression on the lower end of that scale. And you certainly see people that are overpaying. They just want to get a deal done. They think they can raise rent 7% annually and hit their numbers. You're not going to be able to do that this year. I don't think. No, the, the whole race of the rent aspect of things, I think is right. I think you're going to be looking to, yeah. to, to maintain it. If not, uh, you know, make some sort of, uh, you know, give in a little bit, help out your, your tenants if it's possible yeah. out there for you. What, uh, yeah. what, what are you seeing across your properties right now? Just let's look at what, where it's at right now. Are you, what kind of, uh, payment rates are you, are you seeing people, you know, in the high 90s still percent collections? Or are you seeing a little bit more of, of leniency on that stuff? How's that kind of working out for you right now in your properties? Yeah, great question. So if we look nationally, you know, we're seeing, you know, mid, mid eighties or collections. And, you know, typically if you go back a year, you're seeing like, you know, high, high eighties is your typical collection. Um, so, you know, they're off a little bit. Um, if you look at our portfolio, you know, the properties that I own, we have about 1200 units total uh, in, in the uh, properties that we own going back to 1974, all the way up to 2014, the properties built in the seventies um, or, or eight or early eighties, we're seeing collections in the high eighties. Uh, that, that segment is 88, 89% collections, April and May. So solid, not fantastic. The properties that are, you know, more on the B plus a minus side, those collections are essentially unchanged. So we're talking about 97, 98, 99%. Wow. That's phenomenal. That's, that's, that's yeah. really good. Where, where's the, uh, the, what's the geographic makeup of your, your unit? So is it all there roughly around where you're located or, or spread out a little bit? A good question. So again, I, I stated, I, I moved to the Southeast on purpose to follow these demographic trends. I like the Southeast from a multifamily space. I've owned properties in Texas and South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia, um, with my partners, Kentucky, Tennessee. But right now, our portfolio is mainly based in the uh, greater Atlanta market, as well as North Carolina. So we're talking about Raleigh, Charlotte, uh, you know, Atlanta, there's 30 some different sub markets in that MSA. Um, and, you know, the, uh, the Raleigh and Charlotte properties are doing are doing quite well, they've been very stable. And the Carolinas haven't been hit that hard by the COVID-19 situation. Obviously, Georgia's already open. South Carolina's open. North Carolina just moved into phase two. So I'm, I'm hopeful that we're going to keep moving through this in a positive fashion, but certainly there's going to be some short-term effects. Mm, definitely. Now, let's talk a little bit. Um, let's talk about some of your note past, your, 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 your past dabbling or past being a note investor on stuff like that. What kind of, uh, what kind of those deals made up over the multifamily, single family, what kind of uh, a breakdown where that. Yeah. So, uh, my, uh, my partner and I, we were buying pools of distressed debt from banks and, uh, his group was working them out. I was funding and this was, uh, um, I'm trying to think I've got to go back. I want to be accurate, but like 2014, 2015. So coming out of the great recession, as we were starting to see property prices start to climb, you know, we were, and you're probably very familiar with this. We were able to buy debt for, you know, sometimes nine cents, 15 cents on the dollar. And towards the end of that, we were looking at prices, you know, 25 cents on the dollar. So, um, you know, we were, those were mostly, uh, I'm sorry, those were entirely single family seconds. And most of those were non-performing seconds that we were buying and, and working out. So, you know, I mean, if you're buying for 10 cents on the dollar, Scott, I know you're very familiar with this space. You don't have to have a lot of them work out well to, to do very well. Um, and it was a, it was, it was a profitable space, but uh, around that same time, I was, I was starting to invest in the multifamily side and I made a decision to focus my active endeavors on the multifamily space at that time. Um, and I, I started, I moved into a passive uh, role with the uh, distressed debt that we were buying. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Seconds. We're going definitely very for pennies on the dollar. <laughs> uh, that market's mm -hmm. obviously rebounded really strongly as the values have come yeah. back the last couple of years, to the point where that's almost an overpriced segment uh in the debt space too for, for the most part but hey there's still opportunity out there in so many different ways 
um, on the real estate side. Where do you see uh, with with the investors that you're dealing with? What do you see are, are probably the three biggest things that they're looking for uh, for those that are looking to raise capital, looking to do syndication, especially with the different deals that you've done? What are some of the things? Uh, maybe the biggest obstacle, biggest questions that people are, are asking or looking to answer. And this is kind of a way for our uh, our listeners out there that are looking to raise capital for their first deal or a, a bigger project. What are some of the things that you'd recommend people talk about? Yeah, so there's a couple different directions we can take this, Scott. So uh, when I talk to an investor, I, I kind of tell them what our goals are. You know, our goals are capital preservation, income, and then appreciation in that order. So we're looking for stable cash producing assets and we want to make sure that they have low occupancy rates where they can break even so like this property we just acquired last week 55 percent break even occupancy so very very stable um, cash producing asset low break even occupancy um, when it comes to what investors are concerned about or or what they're looking for maybe why you know maybe why investors invest with us uh, they're looking for diversification they're looking for stability in their portfolio. Uh, again, I dive into this in my book. I talk about how you know if you can bring 20 to 30 percent of your portfolio into income producing real estate, you can. This is why I call it the holy grail. A little sneak peek in the book is because you can increase the returns of your portfolio and decrease the risk. And my my MBA is in portfolio management. I almost got a PhD in finance. I absolutely love it. And I talk about the sharp ratio. And I don't think a lot of investors really know that the ultra rich have about 30% of their assets in income producing real estate. And the reason is it's so stable. It's producing cash. When the stock market's dropping 20, 30%, like we saw in March, your properties are probably not dropping by 20 or 30%. You know, do, do properties go down in value? Sure they do but they're more stable. And that part of that is the illiquidity. So that's kind of the, the downside. You know, investors say, hey, can I, when do I get my money back? How do I get my money back? That's a big concern for investors. So if you're an investor, I think you need to ask, ask a few questions. You need to say, am I comfortable with the strategy overall? Am I comfortable with the market? And I, am I comfortable with the operator? And that's really before you even look into the deal because you might see the best deal in the world in a, in a market that you know is a one factory town that's been dying for 20 years. And you might be like, oh, it's 12% cash on cash. Well, if you can't sell that asset or people are moving and, and stop paying rents, you know, that's not a good deal. So you always want to ask, like, when do you get your money back? Um, the illiquidity is a benefit from in terms of stability. It's also a detriment if you say, hey, I got to have my money back in 12, 24 months. Um, the multifamily space uh, may not be right for you. And if you're putting together deals and you're looking for investors, you need to make sure you educate them on that or you have some sort of provision um, to make sure that investors know when that's going to happen. Yeah, those are totally, I love great nuggets. Hang on. The nuggets there for actually, I'm gonna throw the whole. Oh, I like that. I gotta get one of those. <laughs> well, that's, that's what the double. Like break, it's like Breaking Bad, the character in the wheelchair. You know, <laughs> I gotta. That's <laughs> exactly, exactly. I gotta get one of those. But 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 that, but you, you said something there really really good. Hey, somebody's looking in the multifamily. I mean, I think only the the real estate investors in the short term. We're talking fix and flips. It still should be 12 months or less. If people are looking to yeah. get in, get their money out in less than 12 months, I think it needs to be completely outside of the real estate side. We all know that deals, especially in today's market, you get hit with a right hook like we have the last 60 days. Yeah. And my phone and email has been filling up with hard money lenders asking, hey, will you buy my note? Will you buy my debt right now? Because they know that yeah. those terms are going to yeah. be So yeah. what have That's you guys great. been That's doing? And I know I love your model. Hey, let's look at long-term, you know, appreciation is the last thing that we want to be looking at. You know, unfortunately, a lot of people on the West Coast are like, oh, we're going to, we can guarantee appreciation. Let's invest in appreciation, go the low cap rate. And that's a death sentence, I think, at some point. So I've made that mistake. We all have at some point, I yeah. think, you know, um, if you've been around longer than five years for the most part, where with the, with the trends and whether you're talking about portfolio management with the market being in such an increase upward trend over the last 12 years. I know that you're probably your spider since has been saying, Hey, this can't stay as it is. What are some mm -hmm. of the things that you guys, you and your partners have done to kind of, okay, we know that the, the music's going to stop that the go merry go round's going to stop at some point. Mm -hmm. What do we need to do to start preparing for that? Any things that you guys have planned or discussed and put in place to take advantage of opportunities? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, that's an excellent question. And, you know, so a couple different things, 
So we are moving away from bridge debt. We're looking at, you know, one of the, you know, you can, there's, there's a few kind of rules, if you will. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's important to have debt that lines up with your expected hold of the property. So the last property uh, or the property we just acquired here um, in the past week and a half, 10 year debt with a projected seven year hold. So we are looking at making sure that we have some flexibility and it's actually a stage process. We could even say, hey, we have kind of plan, plan A is at a four, four to five year period. Plan B is at a seven year period. And then plan C would be, hey, you know, the market's not great during either of those periods. We got to go out towards the end of this debt. So, you know, we're, we're putting in longer term debt. That's on top of what I already discussed, Scott, of looking at properties that are more stable. Because I think right now, if you're buying a value add property and you got to turn that resident base and increase rents, you know, two, 300 bucks to get where you need to be in a short period of time, you're going to see, you're going to see some drag on that. Um, and that's going to really prevent, you know, that appreciation. It's also going to hurt your cash flow because if you have to operate at say 93, 95% occupancy to hit your say 7% pro forma cash return, and now you're at 90%, well, you're probably not losing money, but that deal that you're not having to make any improvements on is probably outperforming the deal that you're making all these improvements on. So you have a deal that's higher risk and lower returns. That's kind of the opposite of what you want, in my opinion. I, I, I'd say if I'm going to take more risk, I want higher returns, right? And I want more risk and lower returns. So we're looking at more stable deals. We're looking at longer term debt. And also, we're, we're also educating investors and saying, hey, listen, Scott, if you're interested in this deal and, you know, it's going to, you know, it's going to project 12%, are, are you comfortable if we only did 6%? That's a good question to ask yourself. If you say, hey, listen, like, I can't deal with that. You know, that's not going to work for me. Then, you know, you have to understand that we're operating in a slightly different environment. Cap rates may expand going forward. Appreciation may drop a little bit. Cash may be a little bit lower than expected. So it's always important. And if an investor says I'm not comfortable with that, that's okay. Like this isn't, this just might not be a good fit for them to, at this time. No, oh, I, I love that. It's uh, you're, ah, it's like a tune and four going off and listening to things. <laughs> but, but that's the thing is so many people, uh, they get they get into it with the the new puppy investor. I'm so excited. I'm excited. Oh, we got a deal. We're get it done. You said something earlier on, like, "Hey, I got to get a deal done." And that is like the worst type of uh, you know. Take your time. Make sure it's a good deal, not a dud, as we always like to say. Out yeah. there, is there been yeah. any mistakes along the way? I, I, I'm sure there has been, but any deals that have kind of uh, when you think of duds or stuff, you're like, "Ah, crap! I shouldn't have done that." <laughs> Anything that stands out in your past, Chris? we've all got them. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And that's, listen, that's part of, you know, I, in the medical device space, I train reps, um, manage a team. You know, one of the things I enjoy is you, you teach people and the one, one of the best ways to teach people is to tell them your mistakes so they don't make the same mistakes. Yeah. And, you know, I was buying properties in the late nineties, early two thousands. And I say, I timed the market perfectly. And what I mean is I put my first property on the market to sell and I watched the property values drop 30% while it was on the market. I was like, man, if I could have pulled a trigger or a lever at that time and liquidated everything, I literally would have timed the market perfectly. It was the end of 2007. I waited too long. So that's one thing. Like, don't get greedy. You know, um, there's a great saying. It's, uh, I'm blanking. Um, it's not Rockefeller. So uh, I'll, come, I'll come back to that. But um, it may be Templeton. But he said, you know, my, my secret was... I always sold a little bit before the top and I bought a little bit before the bottom. And that's why I talk about the title shifts. Like you don't have to time it perfectly and don't try to time it perfectly. You're probably going to get run over by the steamroller if you try to pick up that last penny. So that's, that's the first lesson. Like, you know, go with the flow, but have, have a plan, you know, always be kind of selling and buying, you know, on your own timeline. Uh, when it comes to, let's talk about the multifamily space. So the worst deal, the worst deal I was in, I was actually an LP. I was a limited partner, a passive investor in a deal. And we bought it in Houston around 2013. Oil was hot. You know, things were getting, were off the charts. And it's kind of like about the same as we are right now. Oil prices dropped. The economy in Houston tanked. Yeah. Then the hurricane came through. That property, we had a management issue. Uh, we had pulled some money out. So then we had a capital call. So here we got an investment that's not performing well. And then the operators call me and say, hey, you need to send us a check so we can keep operating this deal. So, you know, that 
and so what, what are the lessons? Again, you need to prepare for these things. So um, one, don't get over leveraged. So we had a little bit too much leverage on that property. Two, keep a close eye on management. And three, it goes back to one of the things I said a few minutes ago, which is be comfortable in the market you're in. You know, if you're in a market like Houston was at the time, it wasn't as diverse as it is right now. Mm -hmm. Then if that one sector of the economy, or let's say you buy a multifamily or a student housing deal in a property and oh, now there's no students in the property because of COVID-19, that's a big risk. So, you know, you have to be comfortable uh, with those things. And, and that's something I tell investors. I say, listen, I'm, I'm always going to invest in these deals alongside you. So, you know, this is what I look for. And I always, I always walk through that with people. So again, the converse of the things we look for is, you know, you can make mistakes by not doing that. Don't over leverage, make sure you're buying in diverse economies and make sure you keep a close eye on operations and management. Yeah, that, that, that's definitely the thing. Operations and management can eat you alive if you're not, not watching things it, really quick. Yeah. Oh, while the, while, yeah. the, the, while the, the cat's away, the mice will definitely play. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's, I mean, that's, that's where the rubber meets the road. So if, you, uh, if, you're, not, if you're not actually hands-on operations yourself, you got to be really, really confident in your operating partners. What was what, one of the biggest learning curves or, or one of the best ways to learn? Because going from a passive to an actor, an active investor in the, in the multifamily side, Chris. Yeah, so I think... Um, you know, really, uh, you know, going into it, I want it, I've always, I'm always a learner. So I'm always kind of trying to figure out like what, um, you know, what are the pieces that, that, uh, make success. Right. So I was looking for those pieces and saying, okay, if I was doing this myself, you know, what would I do? How would I improve upon this as an engineer? I'm always thinking like, how do you iterate? How do you kind of get to the next level? Right. No pun intended of, of performance. And, you know, that's, it's just pay attention. So that means looking at monthly financials, you know, digging in again, I'm a numbers guy. So I would highly recommend if you're going to be a passive investor in the space that you have somebody, if you're not comfortable, that can look through those numbers for you. So you can kind of keep an eye and say, Hey, is, is there something amiss? Um, you know, if you're, if you're one of our investors, you know, my investors call me and say, Hey, can you walk through this with me? And you can call your operator and say, Hey, or your syndicator and say, Hey, can you walk me through what I'm seeing? Like that's your, as an owner in the deal, you deserve to, to see that. Um, so that's number one, like kind of really, really understand uh, what is going on and, and keeping an eye on those things um, and going into it as, you know, even if you're passive, think like an active investor. And that's the biggest thing. Always, always be thinking like an active investor. And then the second thing is, you know, again, going back as an engineer, when we solve a problem, the first thing we do is we list our assumptions. So I'm always questioning assumptions. And you were, you asked about this earlier, Scott, like, how is the market changing? Like, what do we see going forward? I love multifamily. It says on the cover of my book that it's the Holy grail. And I think it's going to be for the near future in five years. If, if we're talking again on this show, Scott, I may, I may say, Hey, things have changed. You know, the, the fundamentals have changed and I'm willing to change with it. So, you know, what I mean by I question the assumptions, I also mean, stay humble, be able to look in the mirror and say, am I right? Did I make a mistake? Am I wrong? It's okay to be wrong. It's not okay to be wrong and stick your head in the sand and continue to make bad choices based on wrong assumptions. Uh, so such really good stuff out there. Definitely. Now, uh, what I always like to ask too, is, is coming from the debt space into everything we're going to see a lot of debt here uh what kind you, of yeah. Uh, you know let, you know I, i'm doing this for my own pick my own brain here picking for you what yeah. kind of what's kind of your asset class i mean you talked about you know cbas parts of the country like select like the southeast conference part of the united states and the major cities for the most part yes yes yeah okay. yeah strong strong area for sure strong area definitely we talking 100 200 plus units what, what's the kind of your your uh property size that you're looking for as far as number of doors yeah. So, you know, you get efficiencies as you move up the scale. So I think, you know, a lot of investors that are getting started, you know, don't, don't make an assumption that, oh, it, you need to go like 10 units, 20 units, 50 units, 100 units, 150. Like you don't have to be sequential. If, if you know how to run a good deal and you look at where the efficiencies are, like you can't cut a person in half 
there, well, I guess you could, you know, literally, but you, know, you can't Does cut that a go back to Solomon employee. and the Bible. Yeah. 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 yeah right. Yeah. There, yeah. Good. Yeah. There you go. The Bible, man, there's, there's a lot of good financial advice in there. Um, so, you know, it, there's efficiencies that you start to achieve when you're like around 150 units. So we are typically looking at deals like 150 plus units. Um, and we're also looking at segments of the market where we have a competitive advantage. So we like to buy deals that are too big for some kind of, you know, mo um, not even mom and pops, but kind of like small mid market players. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we just did a raise, we raised almost 20 million. So we know that we have firepower when it comes to some of these larger deals. Now, here's the challenge. It's kind of like Babe Ruth. You know, you get up and you're swinging for the fences. You know, you're going to strike out more typically. So, you know, if you're going after some of these bigger deals, um, there's, there's not as many players necessarily. But, you know, like we had six uh, LOIs out early this year. Um, two came to fruition and then one pulled out when the, when the uh, interest rates tumbled and the market unraveled. So out of the first quarter, we ended up with one deal, even though we had six LOIs out there. Um, so that's, you know, that's, that's why we tar we efficiencies are where we tar target, you know, some of these bigger properties and then also competitive advantage. We're trying to focus on what we can really have a competitive advantage in. Yeah. But you know what? That's still not a bad, I mean, Hey, uh, one out of six in the first quarter is not a bad play at all. I mean, that's yeah, a very 14, happy. <clears throat> yeah. 14, 15% uh, or 18% closing ratio. That's pretty good. I always tell new investors expect to have roughly about a 10% closing ratio from the offers you're putting out because you're going to either kill yeah. them for due diligence or financing or a yeah. variety of things. And so that's, I'm glad yeah. that you said that there because I think they should drive everything home because everybody makes offers a lot of times, especially starting off with, they only make offers for the amount of capital they have in their bank account. A lot of times they're afraid to make multiple offers thinking they're all going to get accepted. We know that's just not the case. You know? Oh man. When, when we started, Scott, it took us uh, almost a year. You know, we started we started the process. My partner and I, October, November, and we closed our first deal in August. And we we were thrilled to get one deal done in the first year. We were thrilled. So yeah, I mean, if you're starting out, you know, set your expectations. You're going to have to, you know, take a lot of cuts at the plate to to get a to get your first hit. And that's okay. Yeah. Now you're talking about uh, raising twenty million dollars. In that are you that's just a, a accredited investors or you're doing a mixture or what kind of fund setup is that yeah so we we operate under reg d 506 b so yeah mostly you know if you if you ask me or you go to our website it says accredited investors is who we work with now there is a provision you can you can put a you know about three dozen um non-accredited or sophisticated investors in these deals so we do have a handful per deal i would say you know, maybe three or four sophisticated investors. Um, I, and I, I do say allow in per deal because um, if you call me and you say, hey, I meet, you know, I meet, you know, kind of really close to meeting the minimums or I, even if you're accredited, you might not right. be allowed into our club to be a good deal. Like uh, you got to be a good fit. Um, it's a team. It's a club. It's a team. We want to make sure that everybody's on the same page and, uh, you know, we can raise the money. So we're not trying to squeeze people in. To something that's not a good fit for them. Makes sense. What are some of the best ways that you guys have, uh, if you don't mind sharing, some of the best ways that you guys have raised capital or, or put yourself in front of the right people to, to fund these deals or be a part of it? Any, any tips you want to give our listeners out there? Yeah. So it's, I mean, I, I wish there was like, if I had some magic, you know, tip that I'd say, Hey, listen, here's how you can go from zero to 20 million in your first deal. That'd I be mean, a great if, class to tell if, right if, there. If anybody, if anybody out there has that, call me, I'm, I'm all ears. <laughs> um, I mean, we, listen, I started, I, here's, here's the best tip I have. It's, it's really just build your network. And I read, I read a book in college. I think it was called, uh, you know, build your parachute before you jump something, something to that effect. Um, and it was, it was just about building your network and it, it resonated with me. And, you know, Dale Carnegie had to win friends and influence people. And now I've had a lot of people help me along the way. I love to help people. I love to, I've got a couple of young guys here, uh, young people here, cause they're not all guys. I say guys from the Northeast, um, young individuals here in Asheville that I mentor, I kind of help, you know, give them some insight into different things. So I would say, you know, always, always be trying to build your network. Um, and after you do that, let people know what you do. I mean, if you're, if you're confident, you're good at what you do, you know, don't be afraid to let them know that. I mean, 
I wrote, I wrote this book um, two years ago as an ebook, and I sent it to people. And um, I came across a company a few months ago that said, hey, we can publish your book in, in like eight weeks. And even if you don't have one written, I was like, well, I, I wrote it. And I sent it to him. And it's been really great. What I found, Scott, is that it shares a bit of my personal story. And I have friends that have known me for five, six, seven years, or even longer that read it. And they're like, I didn't know that about you. And it's because, you know, I don't go around talking about my childhood or my personal struggles. And, you know, especially if you're successful, you don't, you don't talk about your failures, but it's important. Yeah. So I would say build your network, let people know what you do and, and don't try to fit people in, you know, meet people where they are and, and they'll come to you. Um, and then just, just give as much. This is um, one of our first podcast guests. Uh, he talks about just give away as much value as you can. And that's what I've really focused on is just, just trying to help as many people as I can. And it seems that, you know, if, if one out of 10 of those people I help comes back, um, that's a, that's like we were saying, that's a pretty good rate of return. That's not why I do it, but it just seems that that's the way the universe works. Exactly. Love it. Love it. Love it. Chris, now I got a really important question for you. Really, probably the most important one that's been on my mind since I found out you went to Virginia Tech. You a big okay. Hokie fan? You a you Beamer ball? <laughs> so, man, it's been, it's been a wild ride. I got there, and we were ranked 25th. And I met, met Michael Vick in a pet store. No jokes. True story. You know, watched him go to the Sugar Bowl. Uh, I was on the cycling team, so we actually used to sell – um, is fundraisers. We'd sell like pretzels and lemonades. So I got to go to every game, you know, when I was in college and it was, it was an awesome ride. And then we've kind of, you know, tumbled from there. So I, I'm looking forward to the day I can take my sons to a game and, you know, and be proud again. So yeah, I'm, I'm a fair weather fan. I'll, I'll admit it. I'm a fair weather fan. Um, but yeah, I do, I do love the Hokies, man. You gotta love the Hokies. Uh, that did a lunch pail box defense, you know, showing up on a oh, regular yeah. basis. Although it, oh, yeah. It, it is sad to see the uh, the defensive the longtime defensive quarter just retired, didn't he? If I remember correctly. Yeah, and um, I actually so when I worked for State Farm, the agent I worked for was Frank Beamer's nephew. Uh, he was a team captain, Brendan Simonis. Great, great, great guy. I mean, great guy, great family. The yeah. Beamers, I mean, that whole family. They're just fantastic people. Great work ethic. Um, I, there's just to me like that was a good fit for me. Actually, I I, I looked at UVA. I looked at Duke. I looked at some other schools kind of in that area. I'm from Maryland. Um, but I, I, I got on that Virginia Tech campus and I saw the beauty of the mountains. And then just that, you know, just that good, you know, humble work ethic really resonates with me. And I, I just love it. You know, you go to the UVA games, they got their little blue blazers on and, you know, <laughs> and they're making, they're making fun of you. And then you just, I mean, we won every, every year I was there, but one year, um, we, we beat those guys and I got, I got a lot of friends from UVA, but it's, I, I just think there's that, that humbleness and that, like you said, that, you know, lunch pail defense, man, it's, it's something special. Well, and that's the thing I think more so than anything else, there's a lot of analogies and similarities, I think between that aspect of defense and, re and successful real estate investors, you know, you, you show up, you do your job, you do it the best of your abilities. You, you're constantly learning. You're there as a good team. Um, your networking, and I think about how uh, Be uh, especially Beamer handled the situation with the mass shooting that took place there on, on, the, on the campus years ago. Uh, yeah, I, I, I actually sent uh, Beamer a letter. I didn't. You know, I've been to Blacksburg a couple oh. times for my travels and sent him a letter. He actually responded back. I was very surprised wow. that he actually sent back a wow. quick note to me. But it just says that you know you show up, you're gonna have some great day. Some days you're gonna have your lunch handed to you. Uh, yeah. And if you're an investor out in the market, kind of getting your lunch handed to you right now, take some time. I think you get you had gave some really great pointers without really talking about it. Educate yourself, read, learn what's going on in the market. Don't count on the highs or worry about the lows. Play somewhere in the middle and make sure you've got plan A, plan B, plan C in case things don't always work out for you. And that's a, that's a beautiful philosophy, a beautiful business plan there, Chris. I, oh, that's so that's so good, man. And for anybody that's that's struggling right now or that's taking some hits, I mean, what what we've done in the past two three months is really focused on the fundamentals. Just focused on you know putting out content, you know, talking to investors, over communicating. So you know, yeah, educate yourself. Focus on the fundamentals. Focus on what you can control. And you know, there's going to be some sleepless nights, but but try to focus on the positive. Yeah, Chris, what's the best? Uh, well, first of all. What's the best way for people, again, I know you said it early on, 
uh, what for, for them to go to your website to get a copy, download your book or anything like that? What's the yeah. best way for them to get a copy of that book to learn more? Yeah. So check us out nextlevelincome.com. You can check out our podcast there, the Next Level Income Show, where we help you make more money, keep more money and grow your money. And we do that through opportunities to educate yourself and also opportunities to achieve financial independence uh, through cash flow real estate. You can check out our book, Next Level Income, and it's at the book link. So click on there. Your listeners today, Scott, can get a free copy. Uh, download it today. And if you put your address in, I'll send you a copy as well. Ah, uh, that's awesome, man. We appreciate that great uh, so much there, Chris. Definitely. So, hey, guys, Note Nation, listen to what Chris talked about here. Shared some amazing nuggets out there. I know many people are wanting to up their game, going from the single family to the multifamily, going from the D class to an A class, and really helping you put some things together. Do what Chris did. Learn, surround yourself with great people, and then really plan on being that, you know, make sure that deal works on an up and down aspect of things and that you're not trying to squeeze a dud into a deal or a square peg into a round hole when it comes to buying real estate. So, Chris, thanks for coming on the Note Closure Show, man. We really appreciate having you today. Scott, thank you. I love what you're doing here. You know, you provide so much value for your audience. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, bud. We'll see you around. All right, guys, that's going to wrap it up for this episode. Go out, take some action, download Chris's book, nextlevelincome.com. Click on the link. And like you said, if you put your address in, you'll get something in the mail. That's a beautiful thing. I, I thought I was the only one doing that with my book. Who knows? That's a good thing to see out there, everybody. So go take some action, buddy, and uh, we'll see you all at the top.